was buy-in from stakeholders, that they felt a sense of ownership about their space, um, a connection to it, and they would maintain it over the long term. Um, to us, an OLE is a path, or an active space, not a passive space, um, and obviously has natural elements as kind of a main component of it. And then um, Mike talked about kind of a spectrum here. Yeah, that the, there was this idea of you could have, I mean, it, I mean, anything outdoors could be a learning environment, depending on your goals and what you wanted it to be. You know, from all the way from a a, a place that's not designed for people, that, that is a place that's natural area or prairie remnant. You know, there's no there's no element out there that sort of we created um, outside of spreading seed or something. So that there wasn't a path, there wasn't a seating area. There's not a sign. You know, in the inside the thing, it's sort of all the way on one end of the spectrum, all the way to the other end where. Every single element of it is designed. There's a path, there's places, we planted all this stuff here, we put a sign here, there's a seating area here, and then everywhere in between. So, you know, the group it really needs to think about, when they think about their outdoor learning environment, where at along this continuum is going to best meet their goals uh, for whatever they have for this place. And, 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 and the community probably has several of these, or maybe one of them's this, maybe one of them's somewhere in between. You know, they have, they have multiple places where they they see the, the needs. Um, then we talked about some elements that needed to be included in an outdoor learning environment. And obviously the main thing is the natural elements, that it's an outdoor space that has nature. Um, to me, one of the, in, an important thing would be things that activate all of your senses. So you can hear, hear things, different textures that you can touch, smell things, um, and obviously see like a diversity of elements there. I think that's really important. Um, we also thought that a discussion space would be really important, having like seating space or a path leading to it, um, something that you could gather up as a group and talk about what you've learned or um, be able to sit comfortably in nature. Um, I think it's important. And then Mike talked about um, roles for his students, that it was important for them to design then create and then um, take care of it and so go through all these different phases. Yeah, so the process I think it needs to be an element. It's not just the things that are will be part of it, but how did it get there? You know, that, I think that's an important piece of it. You're likely to have more buy-in, more more people that have ownership in the area and, and you know, if it is something that is, you know, students are incorporated, you know, involved in, it, it's it wasn't just the elements they're creating that are educational, it's that the act of creating them that is also educational for them. Um, and I think that's I think that's important to, to involve our young people in communities and get them to to, um, to to be creating these types of spaces and, and having a legacy that, that is about their community. And then lastly we talked about what it means um, to a community. And so again we talked about how it would be a multi-use space. Um, a space for whatever the community needs or wants, depending on the different user groups that they have there. Um, kind of like an event space where they could go and have different things going on. Um, we talked about how it would be an oasis, that it was nature that's accessible to them, kind of maybe, you know, especially in an urban area, having some green space um, that would be really um, calming. And, we talked about the health benefits of that, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Have, spending time in nature and the health benefits associated with that, and then making sure it was free and open um, for usage among all these different stakeholders. Does the oil mean to us? Do you want to read your? No, I can go ahead. That's okay, fine. so thoughtfully planned with ongoing support by a wide distribution of stakeholders utilized by multiple disciplines allowing for structured and flexible elements and a wide variety of uses. We're wanting a place where kids can be outside. I guess mine is involved at the school, so. 
place where the kids can be outside, something that's not manicured, <clears throat> flexible learning opportunities, so it's not just like a one kind of thing for them to learn. They can get their hands dirty. It's something that they can touch and be part of. Um, used by a wide range of people, and it has opportunities for child directors, child directed exploration and investigations. And then the elements, we talked about plants, hardscape, flexible natural components, open space, and it would be designed by the stakeholders. <clears throat> and then what would it mean to the community? We kind of ran out of time, but we talked about how it would be a way to get the community outdoors and a way of bringing the community together because they would be working together to design it and so they feel like it was their space. So just thought it would be a good team building kind of thing for the community. So we just tried to, I guess we could have done this in bullet points, but we tried to make just one statement that mm -hmm. kind of brought those elements that we thought would be important to have a successful program or project throughout. So. A unique team in that we're two uh, practicing landscape architects and well I open it by saying one of the things I struggle with is it's it's close enough to me as a design practitioner that I can recite the list of things that I think that you need shade and seating and some of the other things that are mentioned here and were mentioned by the previous two groups space is certainly one of one of the things that we need um, and so we can we can recite the list about you need space and seating and place to gather and shade would be helpful on a hot summer day and opportunities for engagement with nature. Um, but it also occurred to us that maybe what we need is really just nearby nature. You know, and I think a good example of that is the prairie right outside the door. It's accessible to us as a group, to the students here at Ames High. And, um, it was a thoughtful intervention, but it was, it's also a remnant, if I'm not mistaken. So there's been some intervention, but it was also here before the school building was here. And so I think I struggle personally because I do believe that, and, and maybe you share these thoughts as well, that, um, that we understand this group, uh, one of the goals and ambitions of the group is to intervene and cultivate these places in our communities at the same time. As a practitioner, I feel the entire community should be an outdoor learning environment in some ways. You know, you can begin to understand how buildings are designed and built and why they're located in certain places if we have an environmental ethic and let environmental stewardship guide our design process. And so for me, it sort of volleys back and forth within my own, uh, within my own uh, mind. But one of the things that did come up in both lists is in nearby nature, it's access, just like we have nearby close access. But also here in the list of ingredients and characteristics that a designed space ought to have, it ought to be accessible to you know, whomever the group is. Um, and then, you know, a couple other points, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Um, it, it occurred to us that a space would be great but if there's nobody there to teach or to interpret, you know, a lot can be lost in the translation of that experience. Uh, and as a camp designer, I understand that the camp staff is perhaps as critically important as anything else in the outdoor education of program of that place. Um, and then I guess the last sort of thing we had touched base on, uh, talked about briefly, was uh, it could be a really cool opportunity for discovery and sense of, it has a sense of mystery, it's gonna be inviting, and you have a chance to discover something and be inspired in that space. So uh, we think that's a, an important quality as, as important as the rest. I, I think the access is, to me, is one of the keys to what an outdoor learning environment can be to a community. We talked a little bit about our, we have kids that are the same age and, and how their experiences are, you know, as they've grown. Um, and it's, you know, there are so many barriers to the kids getting out and just experiencing nature. It could be technology, it could be a road, and, you know, just the opportunity throughout communities for them to go and, 
and learn or just experience it. They don't have to even understand what they're seeing, just the opportunity to go out there and dig and, and touch and feel and, and smell, you know, use their senses. Uh, it just completely changes their um, mindset, especially as they, as they get older and into high school. There's so many things that are competing. You know, it actually gives them a little break in all the stresses that they're dealing with. Uh, so I think that's you know, having these in accessible places so you don't have to drive, you don't have to um, take a trip. You can just go and get there by bike or by walking, however, uh, is key to making these valuable spaces. We're both environmental educators. Um, I guess I don't know how far far you want to go into if we're formal or not. Um, and so, as environmental educators, as the people that take all this information and try to make it um, digestible, like you said, to the general public, um, an outdoor learning environment to us means a safe, accessible space for environmental um, educational experiences that are naturally inspired. So if you don't have a prairie remnant outside your back door, um, I'm working right now with an elementary school and it could be just a you know, 10 foot by 10 foot space, but incorporating these native um, plants into this environment, with it still being a safe and accessible place to whatever group of people might walk by it, um, is really for us kind of what that outdoor learning environment looks like. Um, it's also a community resource, so um, that osmotic environmental education, when we're not available, we would love to be able to talk to every person that has a question that stops by at Neil Smith and to the education center, comes to one of my programs or to my nature center, but we just can't. And so if we can have a space that helps educate when we're not there and have um, act or control over what that information looks like, um, it really helps us do our job as environmental educators. Um, so what it looks like, um, engaging, a lot of things that you guys said, because we might have a group of um, disabled adults, we might have a group of children with um, you know, sensory issues, whether it's um, Asperger's or autism or something like that. And so having something in that environment that's engaging whether it's um, tactile or whether it's scent, in addition to just the sound of being outside away from cars or um, the natural beauty of a flower. Those are easy things, but having those safe plants, if this is okay to touch, um, maybe you're coming up to a family that is very scared or nervous being in nature and they're you know, wanting to get these safe, positive experiences. So um, having okay things to touch um, nearby and of course interpretive signage um, whether you do have readers or not even just the name of a plant so they can driving down the road recognize oh that's a butterfly milky I saw that it's orange it's easily recognized um, and whether the person there is using it for that they can control I don't need to read that sign I'm here to just meditate but it's there if I want it and um, of course some place to have this garden be accessible, pavers, paths, benches, it might not be as natural as of an environment um, like a native prairie might be, but um, that might help people get familiar with that environment that might otherwise not feel comfortable going out on a trail in 5,000 plus acres of native remnant or native and restored prairie. And so that's an adaptable, adaptable environment. It could be, like I said, I liked your nearby nature better than back, <laughs> back to our garden. Yeah. So something that's, you know, right there. Um, let's go out to the garden today and see how many monarchs we can find. Let's go count how many different kinds of bugs we see. Um, you know, just having it right there, because if it's not, if it's an effort for somebody to get there, they might not go. So if it's right there, right by the school, right by... Um, the park next to the hospital when people are walking around waiting for a next appointment or something like that. Um, if it's a business that maybe doesn't necessarily have a connection to a natural or environmental situation, but if they have native landscaping outside, they're, they're, they're teaching people right there what their standards are and what, they, um, what they're about so, um, and what they support. 
having those magical moments. I we were talking about how with pollinators, especially monarchs, you can have a you know three year old and a ninety three year old staring at monarchs going into the chrysalis and they have the same look on their face. So it doesn't always have to be um, you know this is this plant and this is what it like where it likes to grow. Maybe it's um, just having a space for those magical moments to happen and you can go there and see that where maybe in your backyard or there isn't a nice na natural area nearby your house um, unless something like this is established. So, um, And then how to get people there, that human health factor, that writing prescriptions for nature, I would like to go to that doctor. Just have a write off. Give me your name and your pad so I can just hand these out to people. So um, it's a little bit looser than some of you guys have, have stated, but I don't know if there's anything else we needed to touch on. <laughs> I think that adaptability and that accessibility Absolutely. are key. Um, we all talked about kind of the educational aspect of it, but I feel like education can be so many different things depending mm -hmm. on what you need it to be. You can have that formal education where school groups come and use it and learn about native prairie or pollinators, things like that. But it can also just be a space to think, a place to reflect, to think, a place to enjoy and take in everything. So um, kind of making it what you need it to be or what will be a resource to you is important. When you say a safe um. I don't know if, it, I mean, I don't know if you'll agree, but I have children that come to my day camps and things that are terrified of, of insects or they're afraid that my mom's going to yell at me because I got dirt on my shoe. Well, if I take them right out into one of our wildlife areas with no paths where they have to walk through the itchy grass, those are really terrifying experiences sometimes. And I don't want that first experience to be that way. I want them to have fun and be engaged. And so having an approachable area that's a little more comfortable, that writing that line between familiar and the unknown in a safe environment with, you know, with me or somebody, you know, other kids their age that are like, oh, this grass is itchy. Well, let's find a bug in that grass and, and then they'll forget about that part of it. And um, so having that really approachable area with maybe a mode path or maybe stepping stones that they got to make in class or something like that. Um, to give them a connection to that place that's positive right away and gain their confidence in that environment so then maybe they will be okay with going out on the trail or going out into one of our unmanicured wildlife areas that is a little more wild. So that's, that's the safe part. Um, of course, you know, we can't, we can always bring in the community safety and, you know, stranger danger kind of stuff, but that's in this context what I mean by safe. No bison. Yeah. <laughs> no, no poison ivy. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, I mean, and I guess that's a lot of, um, I have parents that way too. I mean, I shouldn't just put it on kids. I have parents, well, oh, don't touch that, or put that stick down, or, you know, they have this negative feeling already, like, I'm doing something wrong by being here, or, want, or being curious about this thing, where safe environment would be. It's okay to pick up that stick. Is there a cool bug on it or a mushroom growing? What should we do with that stick when we're done with it? Put it back. What is that stick going to do? It's going to you know, break down and enrich the soil for a new tree to grow instead of don't do that, don't touch that. No. So. Yeah, a lot of people, and like you were saying, not just children, don't have those natural experiences to look back on fondly. And nature's a scary thing if you don't know what you're doing. I can't tell you how many people I talk to say they don't like bees because bees constantly sting them at picnics. Odds are it's not a bee, and they don't really make the connection on how important the food at that picnic is because of things like bees. So if you don't have those experiences, you're not going to make the uh, connection that these are important things. 